smartest people, the biggest ideas. This is an astonishing thing. It's generally agreed that the premier science fiction writer of the recent era, now deceased, was Robert Heinlein. You all know him. We've all read Stranger in a Strange Land. We've grokked the meaning of his work. Well, it turns out that um, when his estate was rummaging through his papers, they found an incomplete manuscript, notes for a novel in progress. And it's a measure of the standing of Spider Robinson that the estate of Robert Heinlein asked him to complete his novel. When will it be out? September. In September. So guess what I was doing at 4 o'clock this morning? <laughs> and at 4 o'clock yesterday morning and the day before, it's magnetic. I've gone that far, and mercifully, on Sunday or Monday, I will get to finish it properly. So okay. come on up this Spider Robinson. Thank you for your sympathy. Uh, of course, thanks to Moses and Marika and Nancy and all the people without whom all this would not have been necessary. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to tell you today how I got my dream back, and 20 minutes doesn't leave me much time, so pardon me if I talk fast. I started, I got my dream in the first place in November of 1954, on my sixth birthday. My mother brought me to a place called the Plainview Old Beth Page Public Library, pushed me in the door and said, tell them to give you a book. And inside there, a woman whose name I only this year learned it was Ruth Siegel. God bless you, Ruth. Ruth Siegel handed me a copy of a book called Rocket Ship Galileo by Robert A. Heinlein and handed my whole life to me. I became, Robert led me to science fiction. Science fiction led me to science, which led me to space, to the vision of man in space. And lo and behold, along about the same time, here came Disney and Werner von Braun with wonderful graphics to show us men on the moon, men traveling to the stars. And I got real excited, and for the next 15 years or so, everything was great. Trust me, in 1954, there was not one human being anywhere on the face of the planet Earth who honestly believed there would be footprints on the moon in as little as 15 years. We accomplished unbelievable miracles in a short time, and then, at the very peak of success, as just as we were on the verge of opening up the solar system, that rat bastard Richard Nixon, as he was shaking the hands of Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins, was using his other hand to cut NASA's budget. And every president since has done the same thing. Oh, you guys can make bricks without straw? Hey, let's see how you do without clay. It's getting ugly these days. The last time I was on this stage in 2002, I bemoaned the fact that science fiction readership was in decline, and consequence, there wasn't anything on the TV news to remind them of us. Uh, science fiction readership and publisher support are at their lowest levels in a long time. And just as the future is opening up, everyone seems to want to stampede into the past. And the folks who had their eyes on the stars now seem to have their eyes on the movie stars. I think I started to get depressed when Robert Heinlein had to leave the party in 1988. But when I really got depressed was in the early 90s, the first time I was Toastmaster of a world science fiction convention, happened to be in Orlando, Florida. And after that convention, I rented a car and drove down the coast for the purpose of watching a space shuttle launch. It was a profoundly moving experience. I've written about more than once. But the part I always leave out of the story is the part where my wife Jeannie and I are staring out the windows of a tour bus at a Saturn booster, one of the two left on Earth, the mighty engines that put men on the moon, lying on its side on the ground in the rain, rusting away. You couldn't build a new Saturn today if you wanted to. They threw out the specs and the plans in order to save storage space. Well, watching the space shuttle come wheeling out of a giant hangar that was built for a Saturn booster was very much like watching a small child walk out the door of a, of a very large cathedral. It, it just was kind of pitiful. Even then, in the 90s, man's maximum reach in space had dropped back from a quarter of a million miles to the lousy two or three hundred miles that the shuttle could reach. Today, it's barely that, and the shuttle seems to be history in the making. I kept waiting and waiting year after year for someone to win the $10 million Ansari X Prize for private enterprise space exploitation. And year after year, it kept not happening. Well, the second time I was a World Con Toastmaster was right here in Toronto in 2003. And I made a speech there bemoaning the fact that somehow we had failed to sell our fellow citizens our dream of man in space. Somehow our central vision just hadn't gone over, and they were all busy watching American Idol instead. 
But that same weekend, I helped to present the first ever Robert A. Heinlein Awards for fiction and nonfiction promoting manned spaceflight. It was a very interesting ceremony. At that dinner, I was shown a quick time movie of Robert himself being interviewed by Walter Cronkite on the day that Apollo 11 landed on the moon. He was so excited, he could barely talk. He kept saying, this is the greatest thing for mankind since the invention of fire. That was very inspirational. Uh, then after I learned of something even more impressive after that, the existence of something called the Heinlein Prize. Not the Heinlein Award, but the Heinlein Prize consists of a half a million dollars US to be given out annually. Robert spent most of his life writing about exciting events in space. He left behind millions and left all of them to us to help realize his dream. That's how urgent he felt was the need for us to get off this stupid planet while we still can. But even that wasn't the most amazing thing that happened to me at that convention. The next day, there was a panel on rare, obscure discoveries in the Heinlein archives made by the archivists. And as Moses has already told you, one of them stepped forward and said, we found this amazing thing, a complete, detailed, at least seven page long outline for a Heinlein novel that he wrote in November 1955, one year after I picked up rocket ship Galileo. And there's 14 pages of, uh, of uh, index cards that he made handwritten notes on. It's all ready to go. And a woman in the back of the room whose name I have since learned was Kate Gladstone stood up and said, you should get Spider Robinson to finish that book. And there was applause. Well, make a long story short, this September, tour books will bring out Variable Star by Robert A. Heinlein and Spider Robinson, and I still can't say those words without a ridiculous thrill running up and down my spine. Uh, working with my mentor's ghost sitting on my shoulder, uh, making caustic comments as I typed, was one of the most exp amazing experiences in a lifetime that's been remarkably full of amazing experiences. In a very real sense, his spirit came to help me, and so did his friends and family and fans. His granddaughter, Dr. Amy Baxter, was kind enough to send me a pair of Robert's cufflinks to wear as I typed. His executor, Art Dula, the famous space attorney from Houston, gave me Robert's personal desk dictionary, lovingly hand repaired at least a dozen times. Whenever I ran short of words writing this book, I had Robert Heinlein's personal box of words to dip into. There's, th there are no words to express how cool that feels. This earth is not enough. It can never be enough. We bust out now or we die here after we finish gnawing the place bare. You got a lot of very interesting minds, and uh, even uh, people who are older still think young. So it's uh, a great way to keep people inspired. When I first received the outline from Art, one of the first things I couldn't help but notice was the reason why the archivist had said an outline of at least seven pages is because page seven ends in the middle of a sentence, in midair, in mid story. God knows how many more pages there were that are lost to history. And my first reaction was, joy! I not only write with Robert Heinlein, I get to pick the ending. My second reaction was, oi, <laughs> what do I do for an ending? I, I stared at the wall for weeks, unable to think of an ending that seemed to me heavy enough for the first new Robert Heinlein novel in nearly 20 years. And as I was pondering and biting the inside of my cheek, I was playing iTunes on my power book here. And uh, at one point, iTunes finally finished playing Ray Charles and defaulted to the next artist in line, Robert A. Heinlein. It happened someone gave me a few brief radio clips from an interview that Robert did in Butler, Missouri on Robert Heinlein Day in 1980. And the three or four sentences that he spoke next gave me the ending of my book. With any luck at all, you'll hear them now. We need to have as many baskets for our eggs as possible. Even if we don't manage to ruin this planet ourselves, natural disasters or changes or even changes in our star could make it impossible to live on this planet. My opinions as to the future of mankind are hedged in by this statement. I think it is necessary for the human race to establish colonies off this planet. This is strictly local patriotism, but I want my race, the human race, to go on. And to do so, they must spread out through the universe. Well, thank you, Robert, for giving me my ending. Once I realized this had to be a book about why space travel is not merely desirable, 
but urgently necessary to the survival of our species. Everything else fell into place and the words began to flow. I don't want to get spooky here, but I felt Robert's presence almost physically, very powerfully every day. The one time I scared the hell out of my wife was when she saw me leaving the house bringing a vacuum cleaner out to my office. Jeannie has been forbidden to clean in that office since I moved into it eight years ago, but Robert Heinlein, he's an Annapolis graduate. He wasn't going to work in that pigsty. I had to swamp the place out. <laughs> and the more I wrote about travel to a star 85 light years away, the more I regained my own faith, my own lifelong conviction and hope and dream and prayer that one day my grandchildren will do just that because it is in the nature of monkeys to keep on climbing out of sheer curiosity until we reach the topmost branch. And meanwhile, while I was writing the book, Paul Allen and Richard Branson and Bert Rutten were winning the $10 million X Prize for successful orbital flight and return, which they did back in October 2004, and announcing plans to create an entire fleet of ships to take you into orbit for space tourism, Branson's Virgin Galactic Enterprises. And none of the X Prize losers have quit either. They're all still out there looking for funding. And just a few weeks ago, finally, the first ever Heinlein Prize, half a million bucks US, was awarded to Dr. P Peter Diamandis, who was himself one of the founders of the X Prize. All around the world, a multi-trillion dollar industry is in the process of birthing itself and establishing itself and shaping its future and yours. It has been all along while science fiction readership has been bleeding off to Lord of the Rings movies because the smart money doesn't read a lot of fiction. The smart money reads bottom lines and space's bottom line looks very good. Now I don't, I, c I don't have enough time to give you the proof of that but if you go to www nss.com, the National Space Society, they'll give you about all the information you need and from there Google can get you the rest. All I'm doing is contributing whatever, what little I can. Half of whatever profits are realized from Variable Star go right off to the top to the Heinlein estate specifically to keep that Heinlein prize fund topped off so that each year Art Doula can continue to hand out a half a megabuck check to some pioneer of commercial manned space flight in the hope that Robert's dream will be realized. It had better be. This is our last wake-up call. It is now or never. We get no more chances after this next one. This earth is not enough. It can never be enough. We bust out now or we die here after we finish gnawing the place bare. Sir Stephen Hawking said it just last week, issued a press release, said we must get off this ball of mud and reach the stars or we will die. No third choice. The songwriters Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil probably summed it up over 30 years ago. We got to get out of this place or it's the last thing we'll never do. We're running out of oil and the alternative technologies do not cut it and they will not cut it by the time the oil is gone. But in space is eight times the solar power found in the hottest desert in Nevada, working 24-7, 365, waiting to be caught. We can put cheap, flimsy solar collectors in orbit, giant spider webs invisible to the ground that can catch that power and beam it down so safely I'll be willing to live in a house built underneath one of the Rectana farms that receives the energy. It might be even better to place our solar panels on the moon and use a fraction of the power to finally start colonizing the place because the moon happens to be covered with something wonderful called helium-3. It's the secret to the best possible fusion power, fusion power that doesn't involve radioactivity or radioactive waste of any kind. The moon is the only body in the inner solar system that's covered with the stuff and it's just lying on the ground waiting for you to come along with a shovel and a bucket. They've been working on fusion power for a long time and eventually we are going to get it. Now with orbital and or lunar sun power, we can limp along until we perfect helium-3 fusion. Without them, the lights are all going to start to go out sometime in the next 50 years. There's damn little fossil fuel left, and at present it takes a hell of a lot of it to break free of Earth's gravity and get into orbit. The window is beginning to close. If we break free to space now, it'll start to rain soup. Uh, forget about the free power. Think about free metal, free minerals. God obligingly took a giant rock collection of everything you could possibly want to build a technological civilization, broke it up into bite-sized pieces, and hung it on skyhooks. It's called the asteroid belt. Right now, we're smart enough to get to the asteroid belt. Right now, we can build robots smart enough to find the good asteroids, the ones full of good ores, and strap motors on them and kick them back this way. And once that happens, all we've got to do is wait. Wait as long as it takes for the soup to fall into our bucket. But none of this is going to happen unless we can get into space on a regular basis. And for that, we need people to want to go there. We need people to want to live there and work there and raise their families there, and that's where people like me come in. We're trying to make you dream of space, to realize how, how cool it's going to be to live there in a place where your back never hurts 
and your knees never go, and your shoulders are never bowed, and your feet never hurt, where your heart has vastly less work to do 24-7, where there are no cripples, where there are no short people, where even parents and their children can relate at eye level for the first time. Someone is going into space soon, or we're all screwed. Why not us, Canadians? Oh, I think it's brilliant. Absolutely step out of your ivory tower and come and see things that are out of your um, sector, your business, everything that you do every day. It's just, it's, your brain's on fire. <laughs> My wife is a choreographer, a retired modern dancer. She choreographed over 30 original works during the eight years that she ran Nova Dance Theater in Halifax. We wrote three books together called the Star Dance Trilogy about zero gravity dance, about how beautiful and graceful and luxurious an environment space can be. Uh, by coincidence, it happens that entire trilogy is about to re be republished for the first time in a single hardcover volume the same month uh, Variable Star comes out, so that takes care of all your Christmas money. Uh, as a result of our trilogy, Jeannie very nearly got to go herself. Someone saw her dance at a science fiction convention, a dance involving some very crudely simulated zero-g dance, and signed her up for the civilian and space program to dance in orbit, to show people there's more to space than, than jocks in spacesuits. Unfortunately, the first civilian they sent up, they killed, and that was the end of the civilian and space program for our lifetimes. One of the most important images that Jeannie and I came up with was the image of the Earth as a womb. Our own daughter was very nearly a 10-month-old baby. Uh, when she reached nine months, she apparently took a look at the outside world and said, uh-uh, I ain't going, decided to sit tight. And you could sympathize with her decision, but it was not a wise one. Those last three weeks of Jeannie's pregnancy, the doctors uh, were very concerned because the little fetus in there had begun to do what all fetuses do best, excrete and was in the process of drowning itself in its own waste products. They were very concerned that they would need to induce birth, and in the end, eventually, they did. Well, that's what's happening to the planet Earth. The Earth is a womb, and it is long past time for us to birth, and we are killing ourselves in the pollution of our own waste products, and if we do not birth soon, we will die of cowardice. Someone is going into space soon, or we're all screwed. Why not us, Canadians? It would be nice if the working language of space enterprise turned out to be English, the language of Robert Heinlein and most of his fellow pioneers, and the Americans at the moment are both too dumb and too broke, having just poured $7 trillion into a hole in the sand to preserve a few years' oil. Space is something Canada is good at, something we have a tradition of excellence at. They could never have gotten Apollo 11 to the moon in the first place without the boys and girls they hijacked from the Avro Arrow on us. All we need to do is to want to do it, and all I can do is try to make as many of, as possible of you want it by telling you how cool it's going to be. Well, fortunately, Robert Heinlein is not the only big gun I have helping me this time. As I was working on Variable Star, I got a fan letter from a stranger I didn't know in California, a man who said, I'm a big fan of your works. I just finished your latest novel and loved it. I love everything you write. Signed, David Crosby. I think my uh, first reply was hymen, 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 and when I was coherent enough to talk, we got talking, and dis I discovered first off that uh, David, like me, is a major, massive Robert Heinlein nut, has read everything he's ever written and loves him, and when he heard that I was working on a book with Robert Heinlein, his eyes bugged out, and he wanted to know, was there any way he could help, anything he could do to help the process along? Well, I said, funny you should mention that, David. I've uh, written some song lyrics into chapter one of the book, and I, I don't have a tune. I got your back, he said, and I'm going to try and play you a working version of it now. Now, I, you must understand we're not done. This is a work in progress. He has signed off on the verses, and I'm going to try and render it for you now if I can just get Robert's cufflink off so that it doesn't keep slapping against the guitar. There we go. The song is called On the Way to the Stars. As we know, it's a step on the road to the stars. It's the reason we hang out in bars, don't you know? Because we can't find our way to the stars. I could bear all these losses of ours if I knew we would meet again out in the stars. On the way to the stars. Every molecule in you was born in the heart of a star On the way to the stars In the night of the light that will help you to know where you are Yes, they are From so far It's the reason we came from the mud, don't you? 
don't you know? Because we wanted to climb to the stars. And in our flesh and our blood and our bone, we all know we were meant to return to the stars. Ask anyone which way is God, and you know he will probably point to the stars. On the way to the stars, every molecule in you was born in the heart of a star. On the way to the stars, in the night there's a light that will help you to know where you are. Yes, they are from so far. Well, I can't prove it so. But I'm certain I know our ancestors came from the stars. And it would not be so lonely to die if I knew I had died on the way to the stars. And if we do our part and follow our heart, our children will live in the stars. Yes, our children will dance in the stars. Thank you for your sympathy. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.